no matter how many years I've been doing this booming thing, I have run into people that love to tell me how to do my job on set. Just this last week, I was doing a commercial and the director who had never met me before, never seen me or anything. I came, I was been watching the rehearsals on the monitors and I came to set, would look around the lighting, leave because it was nothing really of concern. I watched the shots develop on set. Then I'd step off and look at the monitor. And you know, this is how I was basically working this commercial. And when I went to set, because we were about 15 or so minutes away and I first stepped foot on the set with the boom, the director, of course, decided to say, so when you're booming, you're going to be standing like right over here with the pole up and over, right? And I'm like, Actually, this is where I was going to be booming from. He's like, okay, do you need a rehearsal? Do you need to keep, you know, in, do you know, do you know where the frame is going to be? We don't want to see a boom in the shot. I'm like, you're not going to. And as a matter of fact, the entire commercial, a boom did not get in the shot, but I was at the edge of frame the entire time. Why? Because I knew what the shot was, but that did not stop him from the very first time he met me, ask me, you know, am I going to be standing where he thought was appropriate? Because he actually has been doing quite a few commercials over the years, and he does have a general idea of where a boom operator needs to stand. But that made me think a lot of boom operators that he's worked with must not know where to stand or what to do. Well, he's not the only one. I mean, I've run into other people in the past. DPs, for example, love to tell me how to do my job. They'll say, they'll watch me do something. And if I ask them, can you not shoot the wide and the tight? You know, of course, I don't just come out with it bluntly like that. I'll say, you know, you have a wide shot, you have a tight shot. Is it possible that we could run these separately? Well, can't you just are the words I hate hearing. It's one of the, those pet peeve things that I hate hearing people say, can't you just, and yes, I know you're going to start putting it in the comments below and you're going to start saying it on every one of my videos. Can't you just whatever? Yes, I know I'm putting it out there. So there it had, there it is. The phrase can't you just on a film set though, drives me crazy. And here's why. If you say that you're offering advice or telling someone how to do something in my case, I've been doing this for a while. I feel pretty confident about my abilities. If you say something like, can't you just, you're going to say something I'm not going to want to hear. If I want to boom a scene and you say, can't, aren't they loft? Can't you just use the wireless? That's not what I want to do. The sound is not going to match. Like if, for example, you have a huge shot, it is, you know, head to toe and then some, and I can't get a boom anywhere close to them because let's say you're in a courtroom and you're seeing everything high and over, you know, 12 feet above the judge's head. And then you go in for a tight piece of coverage at the same time on the judge telling me, can't you just use the lav? Can't you just plant something? Well, the judge is like table where he's sitting right on top of, there's no, nothing up there for me to plant something on. Yes, believe me, I would plant something if there was a possible possibility for me to plant something. You know, I may talk to the uh, to the art department and say, can I get a glass of water over there and hide something behind that? DP may say, oh, no, I don't want that because that's going to be there when I do my coverage. And I can't have that there because I got to have this certain shot. I'm going to be doing a tracking shot. It's going to be in the way. You know, if it's for camera, they will make that glass disappear on the turnaround they'll cheat it for camera for sound. No way. Won't bother. Oh, well, I should say not everybody does. Some people do some people, some, some DPs will actually work with you and do that kind of thing for you. Now, where am I going with all this? Can't you just under boom it is something that I've also heard on set. Now, first of all, under booming is not what you just resort to when a DP decides to use hard light and blast your shadow on the back wall. Usually that's more of an indicator of the DP does not know how to light the scene or the DP has some sort of limitations. They don't know how to do lighting for a scene, or they don't know how to diffuse the light enough, or they feel for some reason that the sun has to blast in and just punish, punish the boom operator by nailing the shadow on the back wall. As a matter of fact, I've been on shows before where there had been two suns. Two strong sources blasting this way and blasting this way on an actor right there in the middle. And you had two shadows going on the back wall. That's usually something better DPs, key grips and gaffers will say, we got to get rid of that second shadow because they know it's wrong. 
You cannot do something like that and expect people to take your lighting seriously because there is only one sun, at least on this planet. And if you have a sun coming in from this direction, you and you know, because it's established that this is a window, someone's looking out of a window and doing this number at the sky, and then you cut and you, you look at them from the front, and suddenly you see two of their shadows on the back wall, obviously coming from the window, or what they're playing as the window. That doesn't work. Two shadows of the same intensity are not going to happen if it's playing as sunlight. Does that make sense? We only have one sun. So tell me, how is it that we're supposed to have two suns? That's not something I can say, can't you just turn one of them off? I'm sure you've seen the original Star uh, Superman movie. I'm not going to show the clip here because, you know, it's copywritten. But in this clip where Christopher Reeve flies off of the moon, you see about Five shadows jump off in different directions as he's taking off from the moon. And that is because he was not lit with one light source. How many light sources do we have on the moon? One, the sun. Did the DP light it that way? No, he didn't. He, even though it was a wide shot, he lit it with about five different lights. So as Superman takes off, you see about two or three shadows. And then you see as he goes in and he flies away, you see him cross and get closer to another light and you see a couple more shadows. It's one of those things that drives me nuts when I see foolish lighting when i see lighting now i don't know off the top of my head who the dp was he could be one of the most brilliant dps of all time but in that particular circumstance i don't know what happened i for the life of me i look at that scene every time i think about it even it drives me nuts now the reason i'm mentioning this is because it would really make me want to say if i were there on the set can't you just light with one light oh but a boom operator does not do that Boom operator does not tell the DP how to do their job. However, the DP has immunity to get away with just about anything they want to on a set, or rather to touch things. For example, if they want to modify, if they want to touch the camera and make a camera adjustment, absolutely allowed to, right? If they want to mess with a prop, tweak a prop, something like that, they're allowed to. If they want to move a set piece, they're allowed to. If they want to tell a boom operator how to do things, technically a DP is not my boss. My boss is the sound mixer. And if I go to the sound mixer and say, DP's telling me to do this, most likely a mixer is going to say you know, one of two things. They'll either say, yeah, you got to do it then because you don't want to be on his bad side. Or he will say, no, that doesn't work for us. And you got to say this in return. You got to go and approach it this way or whatever. And they're going to tell you what to do. Maybe even the, the sound mixer may come to set. But those words right there, can't you just drive me crazy because they're usually connected with something I don't want to do because someone doesn't want to do things the right way. The reason I'm throwing this out there is because underbooming is one of those things that people always love to throw out as a solution. Underbooming is not just a solution to bad lighting, even though that is one circumstance that we would use it. If a DP is lighting really, really strong and the shadow, like, like, for example, if the body, if the body of someone standing here is here and the DP lights with a key light or a strong light source that's lower, like even with their face, their shadow is going to go straight against the wall over here. If the DP raises that light a little bit, that shadow is driven down. However, they got to do it high enough where the boom that crosses over the top of that, that actor is also driven down enough. Ideally, the best DPs I've ever worked with have lit stronger from behind the actors and bounced more forward. That's not to say that any DP that does things differently is a bad DP. By all means, that is not what I'm saying. The best DPs I worked with, though, usually follow that. Now, you could say, oh, that's very boring. It's flat or it's whatever. It's not really. I can name a whole bunch of DPs I've worked with that do a phenomenal job and have done things I've never seen another DP do before in my life. And sometimes it is as simple as we're shooting into a glass window and you're like, oh, man, there's going to be reflections all over the place because it's black outside. The DP does a couple little things, even though you cannot angle the mirror or the window, I should say mirror, because it basically is a mirror when it's dark outside and it's light inside. The DP does one or two little things and suddenly that per that is completely non-reflective. And they're not, you know, saying, OK, let's uh, go over there and gack it up so that way it's, you know, dulled out. They don't do that. It's still just as shiny. And I tell you, it blew my mind. And if you're curious as to what that is, uh, maybe in a live stream or something, I can tell you the story. 
But here's, here's why this is a, an important thing here for me to discuss at this particular point in time, the underbooming. Because it is something that if you do not know when to do it and how to properly do it, it is not going to sound right. And a lot of the times that I've talked to people, people are like, you shouldn't underboom this. It, 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 the voice doesn't match. It doesn't match the overhead boom. So if you've got to underboom something, don't do that and overboom. Do the whole scene underboom or it's just never going to match right. Au contraire. Not only can post actually fix that if they want to, which, you know, hopefully they won't have to, but if you're a boom operator that does listen, then you will not have a problem doing it in such a way where post can actually recover it. Because it is, if you understand acoustics, if you understand how the voice actually projects from the human body, you can easily make it happen and make it work well. To, to set this up, though, let me explain that when I am thinking about what I want to do and how I want to do it on set, after watching the rehearsal, I start watching how they're going to be covering it on camera. If the DP and the camera operators and stuff have any kind of reflections to deal with, chances are they're going to do the same thing that most people always do, which is, in my opinion, not the most creative, but usually it's the first thing they resort to, and that is going low, looking up on people. Unless it's, of course, a reflection that somebody's sitting at a table and then they just go off axis. And that's that's a whole different thing. Then they end up finding reflections at their lights and other cameras and whatever else. But a lot of the times if someone's standing up in one of those rooms, the first thing they do is they drop the camera into a low position and they look up at the actors. That way the camera operator and everybody is straight down below camera and they never see above, you know, a, a, a certain height, which is usually even with the operator's heads or something like that. However, what does that mean, though? It means you are looking right up at the actor's reflection and a boom that would be up there. Now, in this example, if you're in some sort of a glass room like that, chances are there's going to be some sort of a table in front of them because a lot of the times you're in a glass conference room or you're in some sort of an interrogation room and there's glass there. Either way, there's a small room and there's not going to be a whole lot of room in front of the pre person. So you have to play your cards just right. Number one is you may have to switch to a low profile boom. And when I say that, I mean you can't use a full size boom microphone like this one here, the DPA4098. You might have to use something that is very small, like only goes out just a tiny little bit and has an angle on it. There is a very low profile version of a boom. You can put this thing straight up against the ceiling and you only need about three inches from the top of the microphone to the bottom of the microphone to clear the, the ceiling. Unlike this one here where you need a good 10 inches, this right here is huge. I can easily get it out of the frame, but if the ceiling is right above me, I mean, if, if I'm back here, if I'm back here and I have a microphone like this size over me and the ceiling is, is only six inches over my head, this microphone is going to be right here. The only way to make it work is to lay it sideways. Then I'm not in the polar pattern correctly. I'm not playing the microphone properly. I need a low profile option like a DPA 4018C or a uh, Sennheiser MKH 8050 or like a Sheps CMC 641 with a GVC swivel. Something like the like these, these are options that you have when you are booming that cut down on the size of the microphone above you. And the reason why is because it's, it makes it very low profile, it makes it very small. It's awesome when you can resort to something like that. That also doesn't mean, it doesn't just mean that you have the clearance overhead. It could mean you need it from underneath because if a table is even with my waist and the shot is about at my belly button, if you want to try to get anything down there with this big, huge microphone, it's going to be resting on the table, making all kinds of grinding noises and stuff, uh, you know, sliding noises across the table. And this could still be in the shot looking up at me. You don't want to have that. So you have to go into a low profile mode. Now, if I'm watching this rehearsal, though, and I see that there is a reason, either lighting, reflections, or otherwise, that I would need to per potentially underboom, then you got to take some you got to take some precautions here. And, and maybe precautions is the wrong word. Maybe you need to just consider some things first. Do you have air conditioning vents directly over the actors' heads? If so, you need to kill the air in order to underboom because a microphone pointed straight up at an air conditioning vent is going to pick up nothing but like that. It's going to kill your sound. You can easily play the rejection of your microphone away from that and it's going to be 
it's going to be great at that point. You can play if, if you're coming from above. If the air conditioning vent is in the ceiling, you can play the null spot of that microphone in the off-axis rejection and, and nullify that, or at least drop it, a, you know, 10, 20 dB, depending on the microphone you use. But when you're pointing a microphone straight up at it, geez, that's bad. That's all kinds of bad. And that is not really ideal. Also, depending on the pattern of the microphone you're using, you could get a lot of reflections off of the table. Depending on the pattern, depending on the acoustics and, and everything, you may, if you're not seeing that table, you may want to put down a fernie pad or something on top of it so that way the reflections are not an issue. Of course, you'd want to do that if you're overbooming too because no one likes to hear those reflections coming off the table. However, when you're underbooming, it could be more critical depending on the microphone you use. No, I'm not suggesting using omnidirectional. That would not be a good choice. However, depending on the angle you have to choose to boom from, it could be it'll get a little bit a little bit of a boundary layer effect which is basically reinforcement of the sound if here's here's a good way to put it if i have an omnidirectional mic i'll just use that as an example and i have it where it's sitting right in front of me right here an omnidirectional microphone is going to pick up everything around me evenly however if i take that omnidirectional microphone and i now lay it on a table then the pickup pattern that normally would go into the table is now flipped on top of the table. And when it does that, it actually makes more of an egg-shaped glow because it's basically listening twice as well because it's using that as a surface. However, it's a very interesting effect. You have the fidelity, the full fidelity coming off of one side of the microphone, but then you have a muffled uh, reflection uh, coming off of the other side, the table, the the table side. So I, I and and that's 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 probably not the best way to word it, but it sounds that way. So it sounds like a combination of of fidelity, crispness, and a little bit of diffuse sound. I guess is a good way to put it. And if you if you have not seen the video that I did on um, where I discuss this in in greater detail, then uh, you might want to check that one out because. Um, my mind is, of course, slipping, and you know that's part of this whole thing of, of me explaining everything that um, you know, all the techniques and stuff. But I'm I'm slipping while I'm talking to you and not remembering which video this is. But because at this point I've done quite a few, but I will put a link to the to it in the description. I'll even throw it up there. How's that? So you can check it out. That video is the one that you're going to want to watch. It will explain a little bit more about that. Back to underbooming, though. Why is it so difficult to get underbooming right? That's because when people normally listen to someone, they're listening straight on, where you get a balance of both of your ears on someone's face, and you balance it evenly with their chest and their, and their uh, mouth and their head. Everything resonates sound, believe it or not. It's not just the vocal box. The vocal, the vo vocal cords, even though that's a big part of it, the vocal cords only help shape certain frequencies, and believe it or not, they don't even go up, go up as high as your actual voice does. A lot of that's in resonance. And the fundamental frequencies of the human voice, usually for a male, is somewhere around 100 hertz up to maybe 3,500 hertz. And for a female, is maybe around 125 hertz all the way up to maybe 4,000 hertz. Believe it or not, that's the actual base of the human voice right there. And I can discuss this in another video. If you're interested, just write it down in the description and let me know that's what you'd like to hear me talk about. If that's the case, then how is it then that we start talking about boosting at 5K or at 8K? If you want to get some air in there, you have to boost. If you want presence boost, all these are in the higher frequencies, higher than the human voice. How does that work? Harmonics and overtones. Again, if you want to hear about this, write down in the, in the comment section below. However, when you are right in front of me, listening to me from the front, you are getting a balance of the lows, mids, and highs straight from this perspective. You are used to hearing people from this perspective. If you put a microphone over my head, it is going to pick it up very naturally because it balances everything very well from that position. Your base of your voice the base of your voice is going to disperse in all directions, but the highs are going to be in one particular direction. It's going to be going more in one, one direction because they're more omnidirectional. The lows in my voice are going to disperse pretty quickly. However, if you have a microphone that's coming in from above, 
It is going to pick up the highs and it's going to pick up the lows, but because it's so close in proximity, it's going to balance the two well. It's going to pick it up nicely and balanced because the highs don't have as much power as the lows. And if you start to go too far away, then you're going to lose the lows anyway. But in close proximity, especially, then it's going to do a good job of balancing them out. You start to go too far away, all you're going to be getting is highs anyway. You're not going to necessarily need to underbend them. You're just going to have to angle in towards somebody and then it'll, it'll make it sound, you know, as well as it possibly can, I guess. Or go to a longer, longer microphone. Go to a short shotgun. Go to a longer shotgun. Longer shotgun like a, uh, a Neumann KMR82i or a uh, Sheps MKH70 or an MKH816, something like that, where you can get a good five, six feet away and still get a good vocal response, a, bit, a good low end response out of someone's voice. You're gonna, it's gonna sound a lot better than it would be if you're using a cardioid or a super cardioid, hypercardioid, only about a foot away. I mean, well, I, I won't say that. I will say if you put that microphone at six feet away, that's what I actually meant. If you put that microphone at six feet away, then it's going to sound better on a longer full length shotgun. But I digress. When you underboom, here's where the problem is. That balance of lows and highs is thrown upside down. And because you have the microphone closest to the chest cavity, have you ever talked to someone and put their, their your head like when you were younger, you would put your head on someone's chest, maybe talking to them, maybe your spouse, loved one, something like that. You're talking to them. You might just be cuddling up and you have your ear on their chest and they talk. They talk. All you hear is you hear that low end rumble, right? That's because it is so present. Even if you take your ear off of their chest, you are still hearing those low end frequencies so much higher than the higher frequencies. And that's because it is so much when you talk, you are a you are balancing the way your voice sounds is because it's a combination of the lows and highs at a certain, you know, optimal distance. And you're able to shove out the frequencies from your chest and from your head and from your vo vocal box and everything in such a way where they balance together to make a voice that sounds like yours. When you suddenly go from underneath you were hearing the chest cavity, which is by, by no means the, the most fair way that you want to hear it. It is a very bassy sound when you hear that first. When you are not coming from above or coming from straight in front of someone, you are hearing those chest cavities, those chesty, deeper bass sounds more present. As a matter of fact, I'm going to go ahead and show you right now an example of what I'm talking about. And I'm going to use this trusty 40, uh, uh, 4017B. Now, I'm, of course, going to be trying not to make noise with this cable, so I, start, I'm, I apologize if you hear it. I'm coming from above on this microphone right now. And as you know, this is my favorite microphone. So this microphone is currently straight here in front of me, and it is overhead. I'm using overhead miking techniques. You're hearing a balance of my voice right now because currently it is angled directly at my mouth and therefore right, well, well maybe slightly in front, actually. I, I can't really... If, if I were standing from the side pointing a microphone at someone, I could see it better. But to me, that looks like it would be spot on, but that's because it's looking on my eyes. I guess that's looking at my mouth, right? I mean, you, you know better than me at this point because I'm not actually booming right now. But if I have this microphone right here, it is getting a good it's, – it's getting my voice from here, and it's getting the lower part of my voice from here. However – if I come more from the front, you hear how it's not really changing a whole lot except maybe the background noise. And I'm not doing any processing on this microphone, just so that you know. So from here, where it sounds nice and natural, to right, uh, you know, because right now it's, it's centered on my voice. It's, it's coming in from right above. Now, of course, you know, I'll, I'll avoid the whole science of, you know, all the face shape, all matters and stuff like that, which angles are appropriate, which angles are not to boom from. But I'm just going to show you a couple of them. If I'm booming straight from overhead right here, or if I'm booming from the front right here, the balance between the lows and the highs are pretty even, right? I mean, this is, this is coming at me straight from the front. However, listen to this. If I start to come from underneath here, you hear that? All this is is it's, it's just pointing, from, pointing up from the bottom right here, but you hear those bass frequencies so much stronger on my voice now. And I'm not doing anything different. I'm not intentionally talking deeper because if I, if I come right up here, it goes straight back to where it was. And, and you know I don't have a whole lot of low end in my voice, right? You know from having watched my videos in the past that my voice is pretty high pitched. Now, I can do 
tweaking. I can do EQ and stuff like that to kind of give myself a, a, a deeper, richer voice. But I'm not doing that in this video with this microphone. But you hear how the high pitches sounds are there and they are balanced very easily, evenly with the way that you know that I sound. But if I start to come from underneath here, you hear the, the tone of my voice, the timbre of my voice, the, 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 the whole everything about my voice gets a lot deeper. And it's not the same thing as talking and engaging the proximity effect. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking that right now you hear my chest a lot stronger than you hear my, my, my mouth. And, and believe it or not, there's resonance that comes from your head too, which if you put your hand on your forehead, you will actually feel your, um, you will hear, feel your forehead vibrating as you talk. Now, if I had a deeper voice, you would hear it even more. But I don't have the deepest of voices. So if you really want to get a good impression of this, take your microphone to someone that has a deep voice, put the microphone straight over their head, maybe angle back at them from, you know, put the microphone maybe four inches in front of them and angle it back right at their mouth. Like if I were blowing a bubble and you pointed it right at, and, and, you know, whoosh, like this, blow a bubble, it's right here in front of me, and you pointed this microphone straight at my mouth. Right underneath that mouth is the top of my chest. So this is the right angle if you wanted to, to get an idea of what, what I'm talking about for this particular um, lineup. Some, some, and the reason I say that, because the mixer's way is the right way. Some mixers will say, aim the microphone at the top of their forehead. I mean, not like here, because then it's off axis, but they'll say, angle the microphone at the top of the forehead because you get too much bass otherwise. Play, the, play a little bit of the edge of the pattern there. And if that's what, uh, if that's what a, uh, a mixture wants, then you got to do that, right? But in my opinion, if you have the microphone about three inches or four inches in front of someone and angled back just slightly, if you can get away with that, then by all means do it. And for this test that we're doing here, it's going to work for you. Sorry I'm blabbing on and stuff like that. Hopefully you're getting additional information though. If I then drop it here in front of me, you can hear that it is still staying, staying relatively balanced. The difference is you're hearing the ambience shift because I'm not processing anymore. I'm actually in a room where uh, you're hearing the, the, the sound below me. And if I come in over here, you're hearing the sound as it's not being reflected from behind me now. It does change a little bit. Now, I'm not using a noise gate or anything like that. And as you know, in the past, this is actually a set piece. This is not a real vocal booth. So therefore, I usually process the sound because the way I normally talk when I talk in this channel is I talk directly into a piece of OC703. And therefore, it absorbs my voice there. And then this takes out the, the kick of it. Right now, we don't have that luxury. I'm not, use, I'm not using this microphone and using my recording environment, I guess you could say correctly. So you're going to hear extra noises right here. My voice sounds nice and natural. It sounds even as I start to come more in front of me. The only difference that you're really hearing is the ambience change. But as soon as I come from underneath here, you hear my voice totally get deeper. And the only thing I'm doing is lowering it. Here is the proper way to underboom. So I know this is, <laughs> you've been watching this video, like when are you finally going to get to it? I'm giving you information, all right? This is what this whole building a better boom up series is, is about, right? So if I want to properly balance the lows, the mids, the highs, and make it sound like this, but from underneath, geez, this is going to drive me nuts with this cable. Wish I had a, a, a wireless boom set up for this. This would be awesome. So I want you to listen right here. Now I want you to listen right here, right here where I'm, I'm, I'm basically the exact same way, but I'm coming from underneath. It should sound more or less the same. This is from above. This is from above right here. This is the way my voice is going to sound if I'm talking from above. And then if I come from below, this is the way my voice is going to sound. The reason this matches, but it did not, it does not match if I do this with the microphone because you're picking up too much of those lower, lower frequencies. Now, all I'm doing here, believe it or not, I'm doing little subtle changes here and you're hearing a big difference. Let me back up so you can see actually what I'm doing here. Okay. I have the microphone in the sweet spot. I come around here in front. It's still in the sweet spot. The microphone is now straight on axis with me, but it is right here at my chest. So it's picking up my chest energy first. That is not where you want it to be. What you want, what, what you want to do is cue slightly off axis, cue more towards my forehead.
And instantly you hear that by cueing a little bit off of my chest, I'm not going to be picking up nearly as much. Now, this is, of course, if the microphone is straight in front of me. If I, if I lower it, or I, not lower it, but if I get it like right here in front of me pointed straight up, I have to cue the microphone farther away from my chest because if I don't, if I point it right at my chest, you're hear, hearing all those lows. That's all you're hearing. As soon as I start to point it up more and more and more, you can hear that the, the subtle parts of my voice right now are very bassy. And as I start to go up higher, the only thing I'm doing is angling this a little bit farther away and playing the edge of that pattern. We know how the lows pick up. They're very, they disperse very quickly, right? They are, they, they, there is a sweet spot, though. If you nail someone right in the chest, it's going to sound very even. And it's going to be even with you know, their, their mids and highs from their mouth. But if I'm coming from below, I can't do that. I, the chest cavity is too strong of a resonating uh, factor. For your voice so you actually have to cue a little bit farther away and there is a balance you hear this as i'm as i'm talking i'm actually shaping it a little bit going a little off axis to the right a little bit off axis to the left and just by simply playing with this microphone doing this number you hear there's all kinds of shift shifting that is happening my voice is sometimes sounding a little off axis so right now i'm actually at the edge of the pattern but if i come back around right there now it's full again but then you're getting a lot of that low end so in order for me to get rid of that low end, I actually have to cue more upwards. Now, here's another thing to keep in mind about this. If I back the microphone off over here and I get it farther in front of me, it's going to be angled more back towards me. And depending on how it sounds, depending on how far away I have to be when I'm under booming, I may have to go more down toward the chest to balance it out, or I may have to go up a little bit higher, but you hear how you're starting to lose the highs. If I start to go too far off axis, then you're losing the highs right there. You're still getting the bass frequencies, you're not getting the highs anymore. So you have to play it just right and constantly listen. Now this is where the rehearsals really come into play. Back on this microphone, by the way. When I am trying to play the microphone, you have to listen. If you do not listen, then I don't know what you're doing as a boom operator. Because a boom operator's sole job is to listen and determine how, what the, the best possible choices are for the sound department to cover the scene and in, in, you know, in, 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 in get production audio for the scene. If that means putting plants down there, then do it. If that means putting down um, carpets and taking out the footsteps, then do it. Fronty pads on the table to take out the reflection, then do it. Those choices are left to the boom operator. Now that also means that it comes down to underbooming as well when you need to. So when you need to basically is going to be whenever you are unable to overboom for a reason. Here's my rule of thumb. I usually say overboom first, then underboom, then go to a plant, and then the lav. Those are my, that's my, that's my signal. Uh, that, not my signal. That's my, my troubleshooting, I guess. You could go down from one. Can I overboom? Yes. Great. Do that. Can you overboom? No, you can't. Next thing, underboom. Can you underboom? If you can, great. If you can't, resort to a plant. Because you can usually hire, high, uh, get higher quality plants, and it, it's going to sound better than it would if you just play the lav. I mean, not always, but most of the time. Because you can use larger microphones with bigger diameters, uh, bigger diaphragms. You can get fuller size microphones. It's going to sound much better. That is a very important thing, though, is the, that, that knowing when to underboom. And as a general rule, I'll say if any kind of lighting thing is going to be an issue, reflections are going to be an issue, acoustically there's going to be an issue, something like that is going to prevent you from getting the sound as well as you need to from above, you should then look at coming from underneath. And when you come from underneath, you have to play your cards just right. Listen constantly, depending on the microphone, like the one I was just using is a short shotgun. It's a, it's a short gun, shotgun super cardioid pattern. If I then take that microphone and I come from underneath and I point it straight at the chest, it's going to be bassy. If I point it straight at the mouth, depending on where it is, it could be bassy. I may need to cue it upwards, downwards, a little bit to the left or right just to play the edge of the pattern, maybe 5% off, 10% off to really dial in on the voice. You know from having been on set and heard that actor speak to other people, and that's one of the things I'll do when I'm first starting a show, is I'll listen to all the actors' voice when they come to set, when they greet me, when I introduce myself, as I hear them talking to the directors, I hear them talking to their other crew members, as I hear them talking to the other actors, I listen to their voice and I want it to sound that way in my headphones.
I don't want it to sound any different from the way it's supposed to sound. If my microphone is picking up more bass than that person's voice, actually, uh, you know, sounds in real life, then I'm going to try to play that pat the pat pattern of the microphone just a little bit to see if I can dial in on the way their voice is supposed to sound. That's something that pros do. They really want the actors to sound like they are supposed to. Now, there are exceptions. If, for example, they're playing somebody, uh, an actor is playing somebody with a, a deeper voice, like RoboCop, for example, and their voice has a, a weird characteristic to it, you're, you may be told, get as much of those lows as you can. You may have to underboom the entire show and, and get all that bass frequency. You may be playing something where you, uh, you know, and, and for whatever reason, creatively or the sound design, the post is telling you to do it, the director is telling you to do it, that you may have to play just uh, play the low end of it and, and not really, you know, balance it tr just perfectly trying to get that actor's voice optimum fidelity. In those circumstances, those are more exceptions than the rule. Those are the outliers. But if you can, try to really dial in that fidelity. And if you're underbooming, it's not that difficult if you just keep in mind that the chest cavity is a lot stronger of a, reson a resonance uh, for resonating frequencies that are low than your vocal box is when it shoots up sound coming out your mouth and shape through your mouth. This is more directional. This is more oh, omnidirectional. This travels better than this does because this disperses. You heard me say in another video that this is the equivalent of taking water in a cup and slinging it 360 right here at the chest versus taking a cup and going like this and snapping it and throwing it in one direction. That's the difference. An omnidirectional is obviously doing this with the cup and slinging the water around you is going to get everything a little bit wet around you. But in, with, the, with the quick snap, and all the water goes in one direction, it's going to saturate the water in that one direction, but it's not going to go very much in the other directions. That's an, an analogy that will at least help you understand a little bit where I'm coming from with this. That does not mean that it is the, you know, it, it's the analogy you need to work because it's, it's, it's to provide a visual of what ha what's happening. It's not by any means, you know, straight in a straight line like the water would be and fully omnidire omnidirectional because it is, I guess you could say, a little more directional because your chest cavity is, 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 goes out the front and it goes out the back a little bit less on the side because your arms are blocking it. So I guess you could almost say it's more binaural. But, but why even get into that? It's more omnidirectional, okay, as a general rule. So hopefully this has given you a little bit of insight as to when to underboom and when not to underboom. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to write them in the comment section down below and I will respond to them. In the meantime, though, uh, go out there, experiment with, with yourself, obviously. Play with the microphones you have. If you have a super cardioid, it's going to sound totally different than a short shotgun would, totally different than a long shotgun would. And every single time you grab a new microphone, you got to listen to that microphone, know how the thing sounds, and then listen to someone's voice and really dial in on optimum fidelity. Have a question you'd like answered or want to add something? Be sure to write it in the comment section down below. You can also make a suggestion for future topics of discussion. Again, comment section down below or you can email me at soundspeeds at yahoo.com. Be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications so you won't miss out on future sound advice.